This is Palm Sunday, and it's the historic time when Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem through the Eastern Gate and presented himself as Messiah. Sabrina's going to help me today with the uh, message a little bit. I'm going to do something a little bit different today. The prophecy of the cult is presented, uh, it presents Jesus as Messiah, and we want to look at some of the different areas where the prophecy of the cult, uh, in Luke, in Matthew, some other areas where we learn about that. So in Luke chapter 19, verse 28, Sabrina, would you like to read that for us? Sure. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. So Jesus knew in this prophecy that he was going to have control over the colt, just like he did all of the universe and all of the world, and so that this command would be fulfilled. Continue. Luke 19.31 If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Whenever the Lord needs something, that's where we should be at that time. And the Lord wasn't dependent upon this cult, but the Lord wanted to use this cult, and it was an example of prophecy uh, that would come way, from way back in the book of Zechariah. The triumphal entry of Jesus on Palm Sunday, here we have the palm, the uh, uh, palm branches that were put in the way, and that's the meaning of the palm trees. And here's the pattern. This is the route, started from Bethany, going through Bethpage, as uh, Sabrina read, going down into the temple on the eastern side by the Kidron Valley, by the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, by the Mount of Olives. The prophecy of the cult presented as Messiah, sent, presented Jesus as Messiah, this is Matthew's account, and I'm gonna have Sabrina read Matthew's account. Matthew 21 1 as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives Jesus sent two disciples saying to them go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her untie them and bring them to me so Luke has given us this approach and Matthew has given us this approach and they coincide Matthew 21 verse 3 if anyone says anything to you Tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this is the gentleness of Jesus Christ presenting himself as the uh, Savior, as the Messiah to the Jewish nation hoping that they would indeed embrace him, but we will know by the end of the week that the story changes dramatically. Again, the prophecy that originally Jesus is talking about comes from Zechariah chapter 9-9, back in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before this event took place. I'll let you read that. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take, take away the chariots from Ephraim and war horses from Jer Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim pre peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. River to the ends of the earth. So this is a vast new territory that Israel would have in the future when Jesus becomes Messiah and King. And we're still awaiting this situation. 
The prophecy of the cult presented Jesus as Messiah, and this is John's account. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And so that's one of the reasons that we celebrate with palm branches. They were regular branches. They were probably sycamore tree branches. They were palm branches, all kinds of things. There were cloaks that were laid down because it was a way to honor and to show the royalty of Jesus Christ as he was entering in the city, presenting himself as King of Kings and Lord, Lord of Lords. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. So John's theme is belief. John's theme is all about faith. And one of the problems that happens here is that these disciples didn't know the meaning of this at the time. They, they thought this was a great celebration of a great king that was going to overthrow the Roman government. But the reality is they didn't understand what was going on. And it wouldn't be until after Jesus' resurrection and his glorification that they would be able to know this because of faith and because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, the people of the day knew the Messianic implications. If you go back to Luke again, it continues the story in verse 35. Sabrina? They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So what they were saying is that we're blessed because of this king. We're blessed because this is the Messiah that we've long awaited. Now, not everybody felt that way. The Pharisees certainly didn't feel that way. But the people felt that way. And the people would have responded to Christ if they hadn't been swayed in another direction later in the week. He went from being the greatest friend to being the, uh, the greatest enemy of the, the Jews and the Roman government in the mindset. Again, we're here at Bethany and Bethpage and going into the temple. Matthew said similar things. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the Pharisees do the mess messianic implications. This is where the plot twists a little bit. This is where the Pharisees did not want Messiah they did not want Jesus to be their Messiah because it would threaten their political kingdom. Verse 39. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So all of nature was crying out that this was the Messiah, but the Pharisees and the political leaders were saying, we don't want this, we don't want this, we don't want to lose our power. We don't want to lose our edge. We don't want to lose what we have. And so they opposed uh, this leadership. And Jesus said, if you oppose this leadership, even the stones will cry out to say that I'm the Messiah. And it's interesting because they would take peace by any other means, these uh, Pharisees. They didn't, they didn't really know what peace was. The people wanted peace, but they, they couldn't understand it. And the Pharisees stole it away from them. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you into the ground 
you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That phrase, the time of God's coming to you, meant a great deal. They all wanted peace. Everybody wanted peace, but some wanted peace from the Roman government. Others wanted peace so that they could just do their, their business and continue their corruptions like the Pharisees. But here, uh, they wanted, the general population wanted peace, but they didn't understand how to get it. And they would take it by any means except for the means that Jesus wanted to give it to them. Now, here's the third temple, uh, the Millennial Temple, that's coming up. Here's a concept of it. We don't know if it looks like this. This is just some art artist rendering. But in the future, when Jesus does come back through that uh, Golden Gate, when he comes through that Eastern Gate, we will know that the, uh, he will come and he will introduce himself in the Millennial Temple. And then he will rule, and then he will reign, and then everything will be <coughs> peace the way it's supposed to be, and not peace at any price. Here's what it looks like now. That would be the Eastern Gate. It's boarded up, or I shouldn't say stoned up, walled up right now. And uh, there's cemeteries on uh, the outside of it. The East Gate was closed by the Muslims in 810 AD and reopened in 1102 AD by the Crusaders. And then it was walled by Saladin, up by Saladin, the first Sultan of Egypt, after regaining Jerusalem in 1137 AD. The Muslim uh, conquerors, the Ottoman Turks, added great stones to the Golden Gate in 1530 AD, and a cemetery was planted in front of, in front of it, thinking that Jehovah, the Jewish Messiah, would not set foot in a cemetery. And so it's been that way to this day. You can go visit those cemeteries. Many believe this was done to prevent the entrance of the Jewish Messiah through that gate and was foretold, as was foretold, by known Old Testament prophecies. However, Ezekiel prophesied, prophesied that the shutting of this gate itself around 600 BC, that it would be shut because the Lord Jehovah or Yahweh, the God of Israel, hath entered in it, in by it, therefore it shall be shut. Actually, he did not. He did not, yeah. But it wasn't that Ezekiel's fulfillment wasn't, a, a prophecy wasn't fulfilled. It was more that uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Muslims took over, and yet there's another day when that would be uh, activated and that will be operated. In 1535 AD, Suleiman the Magnificent, longest reigning sultan of the Ottoman Empire, ordered the ruined walls of the city of Jerusalem to be rebuilt, including the East Gate. In 1541 AD, in the process of rebuilding, Suleiman had the new gate walled up, and it has stayed that way until today. So those of you who visited Israel and have visited that Eastern Gate, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is interesting that this gate is the only one of the eight gates in Jerusalem that is sealed. The Arabs believe that since the Jews expect the Messiah to come through this gate, they tried to prevent any possibility of his return. Which is going to be impossible because he's going to break through those walls on his glorious re-entry. Now, we're going to talk about when religion misses the Messiah because, you know, you come to church and it's all about Jesus Christ and for the Old Testament believers, for the Jews, it's all about the Messiah. But they had a lot of religion, and in the process of having a lot of religion, they missed the whole meaning, the whole purpose, and the whole heart of Messiah. And they also missed life, and that's the sad thing. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. That's the second time that he overthrew the, temp the uh, tables in the temple area. And he said uh, in, in fulfilling this that, you know, my house is supposed to be a place of prayer. You've ruined it. And uh, they just missed. They, they were selling religion. They were selling, and we're still selling religion today. And it's a sad, sad thing. But they just missed it because religion ought to be free. Religion ought to be Jesus Christ handed to you as Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, dying for you, living for you, and making your life what it ought to be. We're going to close with this today. 
It's a really favorite song. And it talks about what Jesus Christ did for us in the whole process. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer just before we close. Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his goodness and his grace. Thank you for the Palm Sunday that we can celebrate, that we know that he is coming back, that he is coming for us, and that life is going to be immeasurably better all around just because of who he is. And we close now, Lord, with your grace and your love. In Jesus' name, amen.